this Hello, is everyone. Um, we are live, I think. We yes. are live, yes. Let me check with And we hope it's working. Yeah. Well, look, I'm now tall enough I'm out of camera shot, so that's it. Uh, you see, this is, this is why I'm. I'll stay, if I, I will step down. There you go. Yeah. So now I'm a navigator. Yeah. So audio check. Yeah. We have a grand audience of two at the moment. To be fair, isn't that surprising considering we. Uh, considering two, 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 three, two for locks for everyone at home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, is thanks to John, Dan, and we're also joined today by Arthur, if you want to hear a second. And yes, we're aboard HMCS Sackville, the last yeah. remaining flag class Corvette. Yes! Yeah, we're here. cool. We were here yesterday. Um, we were, to be honest, looking at, looking at her most of yesterday. Here is Art, he's the chief of the ship. Well, yeah. So for those Sorry. of you who are unaware, obviously you're watching this on my channel, you know who I am, I am one would hope. Um, Dr. Alexander Clark, he of the bright orange iron brew colour shirt. Which you designed for me, so it looks really yes. good. <laughs> of course. Um, and as we said... Morning, welcome to Sackville. My name is Zark Forward. I'm the uh, chief of the ship here in charge of daily maintenance and routine on board. <laughs> so, obviously this, I think this is uh, so far the smallest of the ships that we've seen. It is. Um, but also incredibly neat. <laughs> and incredibly pretty because it's in its full sort of Atlantic campaign camouflage, sort of the, the blue and the whites. And the, it's really, really lovely. Yes. It's not just neat, it's pretty. I mean, most of these ships these days, you just see them, they are in their grey. I'm actually going to sit on the floor. Which is sort of, how do I put this? It's. Um, it's not really how they were. This is how the ships were during wartime. They were in camo. Yeah. The grey thing is a modern sort of NATO standard. People keep asking me why the ship is painted this colour. And I often ask them, have you ever seen one of these on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland in a big fog bank? And everybody says no. And it says neither of anybody else. <laughs> neither did any of the U-boats. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a there's a few things. And the thing is, it, you know, it's not just that it's the last remaining Corvette. There's also a lot of um, rather unique things on this ship. Uh, they're either very rare or completely unique to this vessel. So, for example, you know, either side of us here on the bridge, we've got single orlicans. Okay, there's a fair number of single and twin orlicans on various museum ships, but what there aren't on practically any museum ship that I'm aware of, 40 millimeter pom poms. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a single pom pom in the gun tub aft, so you can guarantee that's where we'll, we'll be going. Because even Belfast, which is of course a British period ship of that time. Um, she had pom poms when she was in World War II, but she's not in her World War II configuration anymore. That's so not have it at all. No. The, oh, wow. the smallest, the smallest gun that's on there is the 40 millimeter Bofors, which, let's be fair, is present on almost every large World War II museum ship. Um, we've also got down in the depths vertical triple expansion engines, which he is looking forward to seeing quite tremendously. We there was actually a whole debate as to whether the live should be done from down there or up here, but we decided, frankly. Well, it's also the, the point of the focus in one of our favourite movies. So, you know, we were going to do it from up here. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, obviously almost every surviving museum ship from World War II has turbines. But these ships were designed with vertical triple expansion engines, both because manufacturing the gearboxes for geared turbines and the turbines themselves was something of an economic and industrial throttle, even for the combined industrial might of the Allies and they didn't have to go particularly quickly and that's what turbines were for for the most part and mostly they were keeping up with ships which were also vertical triple expansion mm. so much older vertical yeah. triple expansion and, and much easier to man the royal yes. canadian navy for example went to the railroads and poached a lot of their people to, to run the steam plant down here because it was essentially the same mm. which is why you were saying earlier that people the crews on these ships they come from the fishing villages and they come from the prairies that's right exactly. and probably the ones who come from the prairies are quite a lot of them are the railwaymen would be yeah. with that yeah. that's right yeah. yeah and it means all your reservists all your merchant marine sailors who yeah. have all been on vertical triple expansion ships can quite easily slot into running this which is another huge advantage if you're um, building a navy from scratch yeah. very quickly. Just let's be honest, that's what... It, it, yeah. the, the Canadian Navy, there is in, there's the Museum of the Atlantic over there, which is a lovely museum to go to, and we'll hope to do something in there at some point today. And they have in there this beautiful model, which is the entire Canadian Navy <laughs> as existed in 1939 before war began. And it's about a dozen vessels. And then you realize over the war expands to the third largest in the world by tonnage and number of ships because of 
the sheer quantity of small vessels, corvettes, frigates and destroyers they actually build up to. And those crews all come from pretty much nowhere. They don't exist. And that's not going to have years of training. They're not going to have years of experience. And when I say those crews, crews come from nowhere, they're commanding officers. They're, of course, the first commanding officer of of Sackville was an interesting gentleman. Yes, for sure. Uh, you can just gave us a very interesting story where, well, you explain. Um, very quickly, um, the, the ships were manned quickly. Um, and in some cases, it was just reservists. You literally just pick people at random. This gentleman came on board, um, commissioned the ship December 1941, had to put the ship through workups very quickly to get it ready for combat. The regular Navy is pushing on him to get it done. Um, so at one point, the regular Navy gave him a list of stuff, go do these six things, go off to Halifax Harbor, get it done. Um, when they get out there, the young officers on board realize that this gentleman is an alcoholic and is a danger to himself and them as the pressure is coming on him. And at some point, although they're all just university students, the young officers, um, they actually lock him in his cabin to dry and dry him out. Um, once he's dried out a little bit, they don't know how to navigate. So they bring him to the bridge here, take a sighting, tell us how to get back to Halifax. So he comes up, takes the sighting, go that way. Two hours later, of course, they bring him back and that's how they got back to Halifax. And then the gentleman, after a quick investigation, the, Navy, the regular Navy realized, yeah, okay, this guy is, is a problem. And he was gently eased to the door as unsuitable for service. <laughs> so uh, just pick up a couple of questions from the chat. Um, 96831 is asking, when did the Royal Canadian Navy retire their flower class corvettes? The, this being the last flower class Corvette um, was decommissioned from naval service in 1946. Yeah, that, yes. the thing you've got to remember is the flower class orders a place before the start of the war, so they are effectively a pre-war design and a, a something of a rush design as well based on the whaler. They are making constant iterative improvements to Corvettes first and then frigates or if you're in America destroyer escorts. So. Given the sheer numbers that were produced by the time you got to the end of World War II, there were a lot of classes of ship that were built in very large numbers that were considerably more advanced than a flower class corvette, at which point if you're downsizing your navy, you keep your newest and best ships, and although some of these ships might have only been in service for three or four years, unfortunately they're decommissioned. The other thing is, as compared to a lot of dedicated warships, which usually have to go to the scrapyard, being based on a merchant design, the flower class are actually one of the ones that the Navy can make a little bit more money off of because they can sell them back into civilian service relatively easily. And a, a good number of flower class continue to sail, well, with smaller navies that they're sold to, but also in the civilian world, once they've been disarmed for quite a considerable period of time. And you have to also remember the Royal Navy actually, when they're designing them, the flower class were officially designed with really a five year life expectancy. The frigates, which come off from a design of a 10 year life expectancy, but it's kind of like the escort carriers, they're designed to fill the need until they have enough proper warships to fill the role. So they are not designed to be long term service acquisitions. They're not like the larger vessels which they've been getting in the war, and so they don't survive. There's um, another question Derp Squad says Does HMS Belfast have 20, any 20 millimeter organs? Again, in wartime she did. But in her World War II configuration, uh, so her post-war NBC config configuration, which she has, which she's in now as a museum ship, um, they stripped off basically everything apart from some bofers and the four-inch AA and the main guns, and that that was her configuration when she was taken out for Navy service in I think the 60s, and that's the configuration she's in because so there were a lot of structural changes as well. So if they scrounged up a bunch of organs and pom-poms and put them on Belfast, it would not be in any way, shape or form accurate to any period in her history. She basically World War II armament with great Cold War superstructure, which considering there's some actual superstructure in the places where you put some of the guns, would be really weird. And um, plus with Belfast, that she was lucky she even retained the four inch guns. There was hmm. a, a considerable movement in the Navy which was trying to get rid of those when she went through her last operate. There's um, yeah, a couple of people saying <laughs> they didn't realize we were in Halifax. Yes, we are in Halifax. We're in Halifax. Halifax. Um, and if any of you that fancy coming down to say hi, well, the ship itself is, is closed to the general public at the moment, um, but we're at the Henry House. We're at the Henry House uh, tonight. I haven't managed to book a table yet because they require a local phone number to do it, but I'm hoping that one of our mm. friends will help us out by booking a table and we'll be at the Henry House tonight for about seven. I'll give you the ship's phone. And there's also, um, 
John, John Ball, who's with us, who's doing all the, twi uh, the Twitter, Gary, at Garius, is running a poll on to whether or not we should do axe throwing this evening, because there's an axe throwing space right next to our hotel. So, if you would like us to lose limbs, or not lose limbs, please go vote in that poll. Well, I think last, if, if, last time we checked, it's 86% argue that limbs are optional yeah and we do of course have a doctor with us a medical doctor just in case which so. probably means that there'll now be a subcategory poll of do we go and throw axes before or after we've been to the park um, <laughs> so there was also a question from mark serrell about the red and green balls which i think is a beautiful uh question for the uh just to explain about the whole thing with binances and yeah many if people want to oh. take a sec Oh, yeah, I'm okay, sure. Why it's more just brass work. Magnetic compass, and of course, um, to offset your your uh, your latitude, um, the balls would move in and out, and big metal balls move in and out, so that you've got a correct reading out of it. That's yeah, it's, it's my basic. Yeah, yeah, yeah mag magnetic stabilization, yeah. Uh, especially. Well, I mean, steel is obviously a ferrous metal that does affect magnetic compasses, but it was one of the big well. Well, to be fair, it was a fairly big surprise for most people when they um, built iron, iron ships because they, on warships, they already had some idea that this was an issue because you had large numbers of iron guns aboard, which caused issues. But then they built iron hulled warships and they put a compass on them. Yeah, no, that's not working. <laughs> um, so you, you could kind of get away with a magnetic compass on a wooden warship in certain locations, basically, not the gun there, um, without these corrective measures. When your entire hull is made of iron, that's not happening. And it's one of the reasons why, if we go to Haida, the control position at her front, the steerage position, is brass. It is made, uh, it has so much brass in it, it's made out of brass because of the compass. Well, and the fact that brass doesn't rust in steel sort of direct, which yeah, is that really helpful. helpful. You, you basically you have a choice of two sort of metals you can use, and one of them mucks up your the compass, one doesn't. So. Um, so, someone's asking, have I ever dived on a wreck? Technically, yes, back when I had my scooter qualifications in the early 2010s, um, but it was the wreck of a yacht that had sunk about six foot on the marina pier, and I was helping to salvage a few personal effects. I haven't gone deep looking at any actual period wrecks, but hopefully maybe in the next few years once so I've recertified, I will be able to do that. Um, yeah, if I keep looking over there, um, <laughs> That's because I'm being struck by existential horror at the existence of these abominations under the board, which are the uh, cross-channel ferries they have here, <laughs> which they're double-enders almost as wide as they are long. They're effectively pop-off ferries with aircraft control towers stuck on top, and I hate them. I understand that so the engineer in me understands that they work, they serve a very useful function, they don't have to turn around, it's all very well and good. But also aesthetically, that, that, like there are kids' bath toys that probably have better hydrodynamics and aesthetics. Yeah, yeah. Based on I, mother, good luck. I have had to check with Art that while the four-inch gun works, there is no ammunition yeah, nearby yeah, yeah. because my three colleagues are forming an impromptu gun group. Mm -hmm. well, and the they, gun does work. So they, yeah. have, they, they do have the skills between them. Um, where are we? Yeah, Dan Friedman. Yes, he is commenting there. People have noticed your voice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, about the origins. Yeah, there is one of the interesting things about these ships, and I always like to point it out, is that they start off the Royal Navy with the sloop program in the 1920s and 30s, working out what they're going to need in these ships. Because there is quite a lot of people going around going, well, when it comes to wartime, we will just build trawlers. We'll just build trawlers like we did in the First World War. And when they're actually make, uh, working this out in 1937 before they sort of make the orders and the things in 1938 and then actually do the actual ordering in 1939 before war begins, they look at it and go, we have too much stuff we need to put in for a trawler, which is why they find the whaler hull. Now, uh, if you tell the story of the little stain... That's right, you can, you can, you yeah. can tell me the rest of it. That's yeah. right. On the port side midships here on HMCS Sacra, um, the water continues to pool there and run through a davit and down the side of the ship. Um, it's bothered me continuously because it leaves a large rust stain and down the side of the ship, and we have constantly fought with it, um, painting over it, it reappears. Um, we've tried tracking where it's coming from. We know where it comes from, but we never understood why. But anyway, midships, even now, um, and three weeks ago, the Royal Canadian Navy sent some young sailors down and we scrubbed it off, but even now it's reappearing. And 
I have the reason for this, but I always thought it was a bit of an urban myth within the directors and over construction because they talk about it. But basically, the way the hull they t they took the, from design, which was a very good design, it was a really good and really proven design. It was fairly modern, but it had been done up so you knew it worked. Was designed so that when you were cutting up the carcasses, you could have a space where the carcasses would be free, and all the dextrous from the blood, etc., would drain out one side. So this is why, still to this day, the whole yeah, yeah. they didn't change it. They, it would have been too much effort to change the design. It's kind of like when we look at the camera class, the modern camera class, which have ski ramps on them, yet can't take really F35s. They didn't change the whaler design enough that it still has the same drainage side, so you get the stain. Get my stain. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's saying get off your phone. Well, one, this isn't my phone. My phone is the one that's transmitting. <laughs> uh, secondly, the, the one the one problem with uh, doing these impromptu lives is obviously we are having to do them via phone, which means that we can see the last three entries in chat. So I do actually have to have it another phone so I can see what the questions are. Currently the camera's propped up by my wallet and my camera case. So we're crossing fingers. Yeah. So um, uh, how far are we? We've been going for just over a quarter of an hour. So there's a few other bits and pieces we can talk about. We do it for about 20 minutes, half yeah. hour, and then we'll be... Um, We'll be on our way around the ship. But please come to yes, Halifax. Please. Also, the other thing, Halifax Airport, far easier and far nicer to get through than Pearson. Lovely, lovely people. Even when you arrive on a very interesting aircraft where you've got one person next to you who keeps quoting stats for various issues with it, it's a really nice airport to arrive in really friendly people there's and some, there's even pee areas for the dogs in the toilets yeah people mentioned the museum of the atlantic yes, yes. it's literally there i may um, have been pointing gun at it earlier we have we we were there yesterday we learned a fair bit obviously they've got a fairly large section understanding okay. about the halifax explosion okay. so okay. video it will be coming okay. on soon and then obviously two piers up we have acadia yeah yeah um so we've been looking at her um someone's hosing down the decks at the moment we have <laughs> Message them and see, ask the commission if we can film them all. Uh, they do have a World Ocean Day today in the museum, so they might be far too busy. But we're hoping we can film aboard Acadia as well at some point, and we're hoping we can do some filming in the museum. We've asked permission, and I've sent an email to the person responsible. So we're crossing fingers. Um, so, and so for those, and for those of you who are familiar with the Halifax area, there is of course the giant sculpture of a wave just down there at the end of the pier of uh, the tag bill is on which of course i ran up yesterday yes, and then today as we were walking past we noticed a sign that says please do not climb so uh, given the number of scuff and slide marks that they're on that thing i think that's the most disregarded sign yes. in history <laughs> so Drac, of course is continuing his one man mission to climb everything which says do not climb mm -hmm. in fact we found the only thing that can stop Drac from climbing things which is telling him the chief might be annoyed with him. Yes. yes. And that is the one thing that is set there, there, to stop there, him. there was a lot of semantic negotiation yesterday about climbing the mast of Sackville, with me being told, well, I wouldn't climb it. And I said, well, that's very well for you, that you wouldn't climb it. That doesn't stop me from climbing it. And then they said, yes, but if you climb the mast, the chief will probably throw you bodily off the side of the ship. Or put you to work while you're up there. See, I don't mind that. So much. The, mind that, the, one. that one will not deter him. As, as long as it structurally is not going to go over the side because of, of my, my weight pulling it over, I will climb. <laughs> Unless I'm told not to. Yeah. Yes. In so, the, just one small thing about the mast, yeah. the, the antenna you see at the top of it, mm -hmm. and it goes to show the brute force, simple engineering here. The mast, it's, it's a round antenna you can see on a pole, but at the bottom it's square and it just sits in a box and there's four shims in there. That's all it's holding it on. And uh, it's been through Hurricane Dorian, so it really does work, but very simple. Just set it in the box, put some gems, done. Uh, there's a question coming in from, um, uh, where's he go? There you go. Um, so this is actually talking, given that we were at the Sullivan's, in, yeah. was it two, three, two days ago? Yes. Um, given what happened to her, her yes. earlier this year, um, what are the measures that Sackville takes for her hull to make sure that doesn't happen to Sackville? Right. So, <clears throat> Literally, I'm going to say just over a year ago, HMCS Ifo came out of the Royal Canadian Navy submarine shed, and we had spent the previous six to eight months in there, and all of the steel below the waterline and up to about a foot above it um, has been replated with modern steel. So the original hull is still here, 
but it's been clad over with modern steel from, like I say, about a foot above the water line, a foot above the blast line, all the way to the keel. So uh, we're, in, we're in pretty solid shape. I've never seen the ship this dry inside since I've been here and I've been here three years. <laughs> and one of the things I would say, if you come here, you're going to be really amazed because the thing is, most of the modern, sh most of the ships we see preserved, they don't have the World War II radar fit or anything like how it was fitted. Um, you come here, and literally sitting behind this camera, you can't see it, but it's worthwhile visiting for it, is the radar. It's how it was, and it's just, I'm sitting here smiling at it the whole time, going, it drone let, yeah, let, yeah, let's yeah. put it this way, Drac might be trying to climb the mast, I will definitely be trying, if I'm allowed, to climb the, ra uh, the radar. And, uh, yeah, there's a helicopter coming overhead, so forgive us if that makes a lot of racket, but just a quick note, I was getting some drone footage earlier. Now bear in mind, this drone can and has been flown about four or five kilometers away from me with no problem with the signal. This ship is so solidly built that every time it orbits behind the, uh, the section of superstructure that's just behind me, the signal drops to about three quarters to two thirds. And it then starts going, RC problem, RC problem. Fortress has got enough momentum to carry it out the other side, but you know this thing is um, pretty solid. Yeah, but, but it was a kind of case of we're building it for five years, but it's been over-engineered enough that it might last, yes. well last fifty. Yeah, <laughs> because I, I do sometimes wonder. And I, this is something I think with the Corvettes, and I think with a lot of ships, we consider them quickly built, lightly built ships. But you also have to remember the people building them, they're coming from the fishing communities which the yeah. communities which serve them, and they know the people who are going to be serving in them, and. Um, that's going to have an impact on how you build a ship because your boss might be going we need to get this done quickly 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 but you're going to be going well hang on my nephews my mates my friends kids are going to be serving on this ship yeah that bit doesn't look right that's going to be fixed and it will get done on time it will get done quickly yeah but everything there will be not a thing that comes that out was done correct yeah. yeah and one of the things with the ship looking so neat is as we said it's basically it looks like it's just been through refit and it's come out clean. It doesn't look used, but it does look like it's just gone refit, which is how it should be. Yeah. For, to yeah. Go around. And for those of you wondering, you know, if you want to come and see Sackville yourself, they're aiming for opening at the end of the month. Um, so keep an eye on their website, and you, you'll get an exact date. Um, but yeah, exact date to TBC, but end toward the end of the month. It's defi definitely worth a visit, and we haven't even got. We've only done one half, well, barely even half the upper deck. We basically came up to the bridge and start to fly in drones, which means now technically Sackville has operated aircraft from her. So yeah. she's technically now a modern escort. Yeah. She's now, she's now a modern escort. She's ready. She is ready for modern warfare. She's a dr capable of being a drone ship. In fact, put me in coach. Technically, <laughs> considering her age, the Allies now can now claim they had a drone ship in service before the Chinese did. Um, Frank Spazart is asking, how did Canada manage to save HMCS Sackville? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> At the, in 1944, HMCS Sackville went through her last wartime refit. Um, it also coincided within a few months, just before she went into the refit in Galveston, Texas, with uh, the failure of number one boiler. So she went through refit, they blocked off number one boiler because they couldn't repair it. So the ship came back here to Halifax. Um, it couldn't because it didn't have the speed anymore to keep up with the deep ocean escorts. The Navy kept her in local service as a training ship. Um, to escort local convoys and toward the end of the war they put some of the mine sweeping gear back on some cranes and she went out here off the harbor mouth and started taking up the anti-submarine nets and the various uh, defensive measures that had been put in so when the rest of the navy came home the other 122 ish of her sisters were came home and were sold off um, the navy was still using Sackville and she was retained in that service until 1946 when she was laid up um, about five to six years later, the Bedford Institute of Oceanography came to the Navy and said, do you have a ship we could use as an oceanographic survey ship? And they said, well, we've got this old Corvette. She's already got the hull penetrations for sonar. How about that? So for the next 30 years, the ship was actually a survey ship, a hydrographic survey ship, did a lot of work in the Northwest Passage for the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. And she did that until the late 70s um, when BIO was getting ready to retire her and a group of uh, naval retired naval personnel for the most part got together bought the ship from the navy for a dollar and returned her to the way she is now her 1944 configuration 
And somebody asking how many impromptu modifications away from the design were done to the Corvettes and to Sackville specifically. Well, I think we were talking about this earlier in that when the ship was being reconditioned, the single most thankless task on the planet is trying to figure out exactly what a flower class is superstructure and, and loadout should look like because you look at almost every single picture, every almost every Corvette is different from the others and most of them are also different depending on what time period it is, if they're freshly launched or if it's towards the end of the war or the mid-war period. Because it's not just the crew doing it that way, it's also the shipwrights when they're building, because there's all these civilian shipyards building these ships and they're going, right, well there's our style of deck, there's our style of this, there's our style of that, and it will be put in. It's kind of like the positions of these, theoretically standard, but they're not always. The, the, communicate, the, the voice systems, theoretically standard, not often move around. They and, often move. And also just the, the systems as well, because in, in theory, you should have a four inch gun forward. Yeah. Not all the Corvettes got one. No. Or if they did, it wasn't necessarily the same kind of four no. inch and gun. Some of those four inch guns had modifications put on them. For example, if we look at this one, it does have things on it. Hmm. It is uh, not, it's not the same four inch gun which might be fitted to another ship. Chief's network during refit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, one other thing I just want to thought, hmm. whilst you're live, um, Glenn Draper said, wait, a sunny day in England. People have politely pointed out, no, this we is actually, this is the other Halifax. This is Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yes, Halifax, although Nova I, Scotia. Although I have recently been to the other Halifax and it was also gloriously sunny. But let's just demonstrate the differences between Drac and Alex Clark because we weren't, we were expecting many things from Canadian weather. We weren't <laughs> expecting sunburn. <laughs> or in my case, just tan. <laughs> because I have the super, I, I have hybrid vigor, <laughs> being half Bolivian, whereas yeah, everybody else on the trip is mostly English and is therefore turning various shades of lobster and tomato, which I find gratifying because I don't I don't need sunscreen and they do and they still burn. <laughs> Seriously, back to fifty. I mean, I do play Adeptus Custodes, so you know I have clearly taken the superior creation trait. <laughs> Gives me, it gives me a, a extra. I think it's extra I'm tough, happy with my Space Marine brothers, thank you very much. <laughs> Patrick M McNeely says, uh, when passing through New, New Jersey, I think this is for me, did you go to see the concrete ship in South Jersey or USS Link? Uh, basically, no. Uh, the, the plan when I was in the States in, Amer in April was these are the, pro the ships on the schedule, the primary ships, and I had this idea of, you know, if I've got some time spare, I can go and see other ships nearby. And it turns out that was not a, not a sound idea. I basically was turn up, spend all day at the ship. The ship has now closed. Uh, the gift shop has now closed. And now I have to get in the RV and drive to the next ship. So yeah, I, any ship that wasn't on that schedule, I did not see except to the distance. I saw, I saw the funnels of the floating asbestos hazard that is USS United States. But to be honest, given all the stories I heard from the locals about it, seeing it from the far side of the river was probably the safest distance to be. Even on this journey, we've had less ships to see than you were trying to cram in mm. in the same amount of time. And we still haven't done anything more because they are all so beautifully preserved. People like Art here have done such a wonderful job of them. And we have to want to do them justice. So we do literally go around the whole time taking a lot of video, doing a lot of work on them to make sure we can do it justice and we've got all the image and we've got all the footage pulled so that we can produce very good quality videos which represent them and show just why they need to be supported because that is the thing. Even Sackville, which is does get a little bit of support from the Royal Canadian Navy, judging by the number of blue uniforms wandering around, <laughs> you need money, don't you? Oh yes, yeah, it is supported by a private trust. It is yeah. not supported by the Canadian government other than, like you say, in an informal fashion yeah. when there's sailors that can come down and help us out. Yeah, it, and it's like sort of Haida, which is technically parks, but again, always is short of money, especially as they only charge $4.25 for entry. Do you put no, on? ours is by donation. Yeah. So we, you, want, we yeah. Our, our primary mission, of course, is, sorry, is to share, share the story of the ship with Canadians, and we found that the best way to do but, that is people can donate what they feel like. So entrance is by donation. That's correct. So there you go. You so. are far too nice people in here <laughs> in Canada. Um, yeah. If we consider in the UK, how much is it for a trip to Belfast? Have you been on there more recently? 24, uh, 26 pounds. Yeah. Which, um, Do the conversion, that's... Yeah, which, yeah. yeah. Given, 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 that, given that I made the, the foolish decision to say to people, you know, I'm only half an hour away from Belfast. If you want the tour, just drop me a message and if the timeline works out, I'll just pop up. Um, yeah, so I was there last week, looked at the entry price and realized 
it would actually be cheaper for me to get a year-long IWM membership <laughs> because if I go there three times, it's already more expensive, yeah. and the year that that gets me year-round access. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, Belfast is a very, very nice ship to see, but in terms of value for money, I have to say Portsmouth Dockyard is probably just a slightly better value offering because they yes. charge you just a fraction more, but they give you access to the entire dockyard for the yeah. entire year as many times as you like. Yeah. So IWM, maybe that's a, that's a, a tip. Have a, a season pass for HMS Belfast. Um, but uh, in the case of Sackville, mm. come here. Donate, yeah. uh, donate a lot. They need it. Deutsche Fire asking uh, if there's a schedule for... There is a schedule on our respective discords, yes. although, to be honest, since we've been here, that schedule's probably been heavily modified <laughs> anyway, so... Because people keep offering us things, like, it was, we, we, we've had very nice meals, etc., and people keep making suggestions, and uh, if we consider, we, we add on where the meals are going to be, it's like, the uh, stuff for Halifax, we didn't have any idea of where to go to eat, etc., what to do, and we, we've now got the Henry House, we're going to there. And that's going to be a lovely place. So you need to book it over a local number because they didn't like to book it over my mobile. But that would be lovely. And there could well be axe throwing this evening. I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> How, what are the ratio currently of limbs to no limbs? I don't know. You got my phone, but it was uh, <laughs> still running in the 90% no limbs. Now, yeah. Right? yeah. Oh. <laughs> but basically, yeah. So if you're interested, we're going Two back. Open Twitter. <laughs> we're, we're going back to Hamilton tomorrow evening. Yes. Um, so today we're on Sackville, and then Museum Atlantic. Um, I, I have a, well, hopefully Acadia we get into this afternoon. Maybe, maybe, maybe to Acadia tomorrow. Uh, and that depends on Museum Atlantic getting mm -hmm. back to me. And so, yeah, it might yeah. be the fourth up top. We're at eighty-six percent. Yes, limbs are overrated. <laughs> yeah, eighty-six percent. Yes. So I think we're going to be doing axe throwing this evening as well. Yeah. But there's so. two hours forty-one minutes left. Mm -hmm. And remember, if the axe throwing goes really well, you too can have a little bit of Drakenfell <laughs> posted <laughs> at you <laughs> <laughs> after it comes flying off. So yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, if you want to come and say hi, and you happen to be in the Halifax area, probably your best bet is early afternoon in or, not, or probably on the pier right at the wave next to Sackville, which yeah. is probably about the time we'll be disembarking. Yeah. Um, if someone's or, trying to find us, just get to DM me on Twitter. Or yeah. DM G at Garius, that's John Bull. D-A-R-I-U-S. Yeah, he is spotting and he is very happily organising things and he's going to be tweeting out all sorts of things while we're here, as he's been doing the whole trip, because for the whole trip we've been doing a combination of videos, tweaks, thanks to him, and, you know, keeping ourselves together in one piece, thanks to so Dan. Far. So far, <laughs> um, uh, or then join or, us, uh, or, yeah, or join us in at Henry House at, at seven this yeah. evening. Um, Derp Squad saying, I says he thinks the IWM is trying to get money together for HMS Belfast makes dry dock and then have raised the price to all that end. Yeah, entirely possible, I'll ask them next time I'm down there. Um, and don't try to send us an email with a phone, local phone number to use to reserve the, Thank um, you. Reserve the pub. So I have a feeling he may be showing, he or she may be showing up. That's um, good. So, yeah, we've just about hit the half hour mark, so we do actually need to go and do some filming on the ship so we have something to show and you. Stop taking our, our whole stream. day. Yeah. Um, thank so, you very much, Frank. Thank, thank, thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Thanks. just going to uh, do a quick pan around. So, Orlikan. There's the wave, I think, if I'm aiming this correctly. Yeah. Do you want Hang to on. show them the ferries? There's the wave, there's the four inch gun. Oh, yeah, there, there's two of the abominations. <laughs> Um, there's the decidedly not abomination Acadia. Which is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Museum of the Atlantic there. This Museum is a, of the Atlantic. This is a really good place to come. And there's really good food just over there as well. Yeah. And the inside there. Yeah. yeah. There's Oh yeah, there's beaver tails over there, yeah. um, which are very delicious. There's a mysterious, mysterious dark catamaran yacht there. Which shows up every year. I'm fairly sure has come out of a Bond movie. Yeah. Um, oh, there's fortification fortification on that island over there yeah. um, you can't see the main fortification up behind us it's no. behind the buildings yeah. and uh, yeah so that this is kind of... Radar just sort of... oh yeah, yeah there you go <laughs> and then you've got the Halifax rest of the Halifax waterfront is well mostly that direction if you want food and entertainment that direction is I don't know train stations where the original Halifax explosion occurred yeah um, which they probably won't let you into. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, currently has at least one frigate. Yes, there, there it, is. There it is. Put out the anti-Drak and Alex Clark, invading it next 
painting, which yeah. we all thought was cute. Yeah. And uh, may not have worked. <laughs> um, yeah, and a cyclone helicopter, which basically sounds like the end of the world put on rotors. Um, <laughs> Don't 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 get him started on his TED talk rant about them. Um, it's it's not it's not worth it. <laughs> well, it, well it, it illuminated the problem of cyclone helicopters. Yes, yes. It, at, it's at, gone at, for forty five minutes at the cost of probably several years of me wearing hearing aids when I'm older. <laughs> um, well, you did sit next to me. Yes, this is true. The helicopter went over. You um, made the choice of where to sit. So uh, yeah. Oh, one one last question before we go coming from Frank Spazzato. Um, I guess this is for you asking, roughly how much does it cost to run HMS Sackville? That, uh, to be honest with you, I couldn't say that number. There is my operational budget and then there's the bigger uh, budget that the trust has. Um, and I really couldn't give you, give you an exact figure. Fair enough. Realistically, it's a, it's, it's a museum ship. Mm-hmm. It just drinks as much money as you can get to. Yeah, yeah. And we yes. will find we'll a way. Back for more. <laughs> there, there, yeah. there is basically no such thing as we have too much money when you're dealing with a museum ship. They yeah. are expensive ladies to keep. And for those of you who are, who are wondering about us sailing away, they did think of that. They took the propeller off. <laughs> um, the propellers on shore at yeah. the front of the Museum of the Atlantic over there. Um, but so. we can use oxycycling coming gear and welding equipment. So Or big oars. <laughs> yes. But anyway. So that's enough, of, that's enough of us for the minute. Um, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we'll be ending the live stream now. We'll go off to do some filming at Board Sackville so you can see more of her. Um, but I think this is the last officially planned museum ship that we're going to see. But we probably will be doing a live well, from Hyder. All depends if Odra actually responds. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. We uh, will. Um, yeah, that, that yeah. ship is Great, thanks. I'll be down see me. Yeah. Well, so that we'll, boat is causing me just stress. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the scheduling, um, we'll keep any ske- schedule changes live on our Twitter feeds, because that's probably the best way to reach people. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, other than that, um, there probably will be another live this weekend from Hi- either on Hyder or from Hyder, depending on the positioning that we can get and the internet signal we can achieve. Um, but then that will be us coming back onto the UK on Sunday. Yes. Well, we get back to the UK Monday, so it's late Sunday we come back. So yeah. We have plenty of time for more. All right. See you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.